introduce myself as we uh, start our afternoon session. My name is Beth Minan. I'm a professor of interactive computing at Georgia Tech, uh, which means all of my colleagues are on the other side of the U.S. right now. They're all in San Jose for the CHI conference, but I've been really uh, impressed and thrilled uh, with the discussions that we've had so far today. I'm also the vice chair of the CCC and slated to take over as chair uh, in July. So please make sure that you get all of your comments and complaints to Greg and Ann in the next couple months uh, before I will be responsible for them. So I'm going to close my introductory remarks by arguing with Ed Lazowski's answer to my questions. But I want to start with uh, the, uh, the vision for this session and what we were going to discuss today. Um, and just to uh, help you with the calculations of math on your program, the two panel sessions that we had this afternoon are in a longer format than what we had this morning. So please anticipate uh, substantial discussion and engagement with the audience uh, as we then go into our, our evening sessions. As was mentioned in the morning discussion, sometimes people have difficulty imagining the role of technology and the impact for systems that seem you know, one step or more departed from them. Although we eat food, we may not be aware of the systems that produce it. Um, although we live in and out of different urban or rural communities, we may not think of the technologies that surround them. Um, although we may worry about or be in the midst of some sort of disaster scenario, we don't consciously think about the role of technology in society on a day-to-day -day basis. However, for the topics that we're going to discuss this afternoon, people, I think, are very much aware of the role of technology and how it affects them personally. And in fact, it is that personalization of technology that may be one of the greater promises as we look to topics such as healthcare, education, labor, uh, the future of aging, and so on. So the nickname from this session was actually Computing Cradle to Grave. Um, Anne wouldn't let me use that. But we wanted to look at the role that technology has on our individual lives and uh, look at uh, not only uh, both the, the parts where we feel that we are part of the solution, but maybe also parts where we are uh, potentially part of the problem or have other issues that we need to address. So we don't have a keynote speaker. I just have a few introductory remarks, and then I will uh, pass it over to my colleagues uh, to start the first session. But I did pull up some slides uh, from a uh, um, article in The Guardian from November 2015. So the images and the quotes are, are theirs. So I'm not taking responsibility for them. But it does paint, um, in many ways, a number of the issues that our society is grappling with is they're understanding how the world of work and life and health is changing and the likelihood that technology has a significant role in this. So uh, the first of five, workplace structures. Forget the rigid corporate ladder. Now the corporate lattice moves free-flowing with ideas and career paths. Um, so this is one simple version of saying it's no longer about just climbing the ladder within one company, but it's about making these lateral moves or these radical shifts throughout your career, and that is the way that we advance today. Um, that may be true in some respects, but computing technology makes that even more likely because the lateral moves are, are likely not to even be within the same corporation, but as you're moving from job to job. There was another quote associated with this that said, you know, my father had one job, worked for one corporation his entire career. Um, I would have six major career shifts in my career, and my child will have six jobs at the same time. And this, so this refers to this notion of the gig economy that uh, was briefly mentioned earlier, that uh, because of the way that networking technologies and upsource and Mechanical Turk and all of these different technologies exist, that people are structuring their careers in very different ways. And technology is both an enabler, but also of great concern for many within this. And we'll get to this uh, further throughout the discussion. But it does place unique and interesting uh, pressures and opportunities for us around lifelong learning, around continuous learning. Because these lateral moves or these shifts in the gig economy uh, means being able to balance and acquire almost skills on demand uh, within that segment. Um, the second doesn't surprise you. This is the, the robots are taking our jobs slide. Um, and there's many different variations of this. But the robots are coming, and a forecast correct, they could sound the death knell for millions of jobs. Um, and I know we're going to touch on this topic and continue to touch on it further. 
Um, many of the reports that you find in the popular press like this don't mention the corollary statistics around the number of jobs that are created through the invention of, of information technologies. But if we go back to that gig economy slide, sometimes these jobs are not nearly as lucrative or rewarding or financially stable as the jobs in the past. So there is clearly a complex system at play. Automation doesn't just refer to the robots that are moving or driving things for us, um, but it also refers to data automa automation um, and many of the tasks that would have normally been processed uh, by human beings, such as depositing checks into the bank and withdrawing money or different kinds of simple financial analysts or when's the last time you went to a travel agent. All of these types of jobs are also being automated in really interesting and powerful ways. The third uh, refers as well to the, uh, the crowdsourcing in the gig economy, but the relationship of the human crowd um, and a new system that I hadn't heard of, but apparently I should have called Upwork, uh, which has 10 million freelancers registered across 180 countries, uh, you know, dwarfing what, he, what I was familiar with, which was around Mechanical Turk. And so this is a fundamental part of the gig economy. It is a fundamental part of the new outsourcing model. Um, it's also very much a way of pointing to the ability to, to work in the sharing economy would be the, the other slide to go with this, as a way of being able to gauge in labor markets in ways that you hadn't done before, but what uh, it hides is the underlying instability of those jobs. So the gig economy works until it doesn't, uh, until you have a gap in pay, until you have a medical emergency and you're no longer um, working for a corporation that where healthcare is a benefit, which is a particular uh, detail of how the U.S. healthcare system primarily works. And then uh, we'll get into this a little bit on health, um, and we'll probably get into this a little bit in privacy and security tomorrow, but the relationship of workplace mo monitoring. So in this case, it, uh, the analogy is to sports science. So if we expect our top athletes to be associated with all of the monitoring and the technology to enhance their performance, why wouldn't we also assume that those same technologies are going to be associated with understanding workplace performance? And so the prediction here is that most companies with more than 500 employees will have trackers uh, associated with their employees to understand, uh, for example, sleep and fitness and sedentary activity. So not just in the workplace, but throughout your 24-7 existence for them to be able to um, optimize uh, your capabilities as an employee. Um, I don't know how many of you work for corporations. Universities certainly don't do this. Um, but how many of you work for corporations that uh, have programs to um, uh, support um, buying and, and using Fitbits um, as one quick example. Um, we uh, certainly work with a number of companies that focused on employer-based health care and employer-based what they would call evidence-based benefits program. Again, looking at how do you understand the data for uh, the optimal performance of your employees in their community. And then the last one, which will uh, tag us into our discussion uh, in the next panel, is the relationship of aging and technology in the workforce. Uh, so the end of retirement, uh, for forget quitting at 65, is the age going to be 67? Is it going to be 70? Um, what does that mean in the context of an environment where you may become uh, redundant uh, even faster with respect to workplace capabilities and technologies. So again, another requirement for lifelong learning and training, um, that your continual need for, for training within uh, a job scenario uh, is going to last longer and be um, more significant. Um, but it also has a relationship to uh, increased notions of growth in GDP. So a number of com uh, companies, countries, not the same thing. A number of countries are betting on um, having a longer uh, uh, working age as being a way to enable uh, substantial growth uh, within that country as well. So the UK and Japan being examples of that. So in short, um, I'm going to pose these challenges and then flee the stage. Um, but uh, we live in complicated times and complicated times with respect to both the, the promise and the potential and the perceived hazards of computing technologies within issues that we consider deeply personal and relevant to our lives. How we learn, um, how we take care of, of ourselves, of our families, our health, um, how we age, um, how we stay employed, uh, and the ways that we have to be creative in doing that. Um, part of the reason I discovered these slides is I was interviewed by a reporter and they pose the uh, not so simple question of, well, what do you tell your own children? Uh, what do you tell your children about how they're going to be successful 
uh, in, in preparing for their careers in the workplace. And it's, it's certainly not the same advice that I was given um, when I was in the Raleigh uh, you know, Research Triangle Park area and the adv advice was nail that job with IBM and you're set for life. Um, none of that advice, uh, anything like that exists for my children today. So I think we have a set of unique challenges and a set of opportunities and I'm very excited about the panel. So I'm going to turn this over to my colleague in crime, who I didn't warn with these slides because that would be too easy. Um, but uh, Vasant Hanavor is the professor and Edward Freimore, Chair of Information Technology, Professor of Bioinformatics and Genomics and Neuroscience at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, he's a past program director in NSF size for Information Intelligence Systems, and he's also just a brilliant and valued uh, co-member of the CCC Council. So I'll pass it to him to chair and introduce this panel. Thank you.